Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All of the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable, because he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minus. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, We don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trusted with a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your miner has earned five more. He, his master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you put my money on, didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. Sir, they said, he already has ten. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. We are in Luke chapter 19, as Allison read so wonderfully for us, 27 verses. Um, so for a little geographical context, that is, where are we in the journey of Jesus as he is making his way towards Jerusalem? Geographically, Jesus has now officially entered the city of Jericho. Jericho is about 18 miles northeast of the city of Jerusalem, where Jesus is ultimately headed. The Bible says he set his face like a flint as he was headed towards Jerusalem. His face is set towards Jerusalem, where he will ultimately be betrayed, crucified, and pay for the sins of the whole world. But at this point, Jesus has landed in the famed city of Jericho. Now, Jericho was sort of a renowned city at that time. Actually, uh, Jerome, the church historian, the Jewish church historian, said that he called Jero uh, excuse me, Jericho the divine city. Because Jericho had these renowned rose gardens. It was famous throughout that ancient world. So Jericho was a place of beauty, a place where the Romans would actually go um, to collect the dates that grew there so prolifically and trade them on the worldwide market. So Jericho is a great city, the city of palms, known for its great palm forests. So it's just a, a place teeming with life, robust in its economy, but also Jericho was a place that was also heavily taxed. It was one of the most heavily taxed centers of the ancient world there in Palestine. 
And living in the city of Jericho, we are introduced to a very curious sort of man, a guy by the name of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was called, as we read in our text in Luke 19, a chief tax collector. So as far as it concerns uh, chief tax collectors and the Jews, Zacchaeus was public enemy number one. That is, he was working, he was a Jew, working for the other team. And he made his living by taxing his own people, by filling his pockets with their money. But he's not just a tax collector, he's a chief tax collector, which means he's on top of the pyramid of tax collectors there in that region. So he's not a well-liked man uh, by the Jews, his fellow Jews. Um, And verse 2 tells us that he was wealthy. Now the job description and design of a tax collector was they were not designed to be wealthy and rich. So the only way you get wealthy as a tax collector is by overcharging people in the Roman taxation. And so on top of what Rome required, if you wanted to make a living that was pretty generous as a tax collector, you would overcharge, you would add your own percentage on top. So now you've got Zacchaeus, and we get a picture of him. He's at the top of a pyramid of of kind of dirty, rotten scoundrels, guys that were were taxing their people, um, taxing really the life out of them. And he is is basically taking a commission from all the other tax collectors that are underneath him. So this guy's wealthy. And, And the Bible tells us that he was a man who was short of stature. Actually, look in verse 3, it says um, he wanted to see who Jesus was. So apparently Zacchaeus didn't even know who Jesus was. He'd heard about him, but he didn't know what he even looked like. That was before Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. So how are you going to know what people look like if you've never seen them? So he wants to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. I love this. So, so, I mean, this is one of the few guys in the Bible that we actually get a physical description of what he looked like. He was short. Now, that's saying something in the ancient Jewish world. Because in this day, the average Jewish male was just a little over five feet tall. So we're not talking about tall people in Jerusalem as it were. So for Zacchaeus to be short, I'm thinking, what's this guy, four, five? I mean, this is a short little man. So he's got short man's complex. He's a little guy with a big attitude and a lot of responsibility. But as I mentioned, it also tells us in the text that he was a wealthy tax collector, chief tax collector. And, and all wealthy people in the ancient world were fat. That's just the way it was. It was kind of the earmark of the fact that you're a peasant, you're skinny, and you're wealthy. You've got all the food. You're a fat man. So now we've got this picture of Zacchaeus. He is Danny DeVito. He's four foot five, and he's just a big fat guy in an Armani suit hustling people for money, right? And the the funniest part of the story is the fact that the little short fat guy climbs a tree. I mean, just you get Danny DeVito in your head and just imagine him trying to climb a tree because it says because he was short, uh, verse five or verse four, he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig to see since Jesus was coming that way. So, so you've got a pretty unique little story here. And, and as Jesus um, passes by and sees Zacchaeus in that tree on the side of the road, he calls him out. Look verse 5. I love the way of Jesus in this. When Jesus reached the spot where the short fat guy's in the tree, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Now, I love this about Jesus. Zacchaeus did not really even know Jesus. He didn't know what he looked like. That's why he was in the tree in the first place. And Jesus looks at him and says, I know who you are. Zacchaeus barely knows who Jesus is. And Jesus says, I know you. And on top of that, I am going to come stay at your house. Hi, my name's Jesus. I mean, he just basically barges right into this guy's life and says, I'm coming into your life. You wanted to see who I was, and I'm going to come stay with you. 
Now, mind you, Jesus is traveling with tr- quite a little posse. And so, I mean, Jesus basically always comes with 12 men. Wherever he goes, these 12 guys come with him. So he's basically saying, me and my 12 friends are going to come stay at your house, Zacchaeus. I hope you're ready for us. And Zacchaeus, upon hearing that, has this encounter with Jesus that's pretty amazing. But what I want us to, to see from this little story, this little vignette and its purpose here, is that there are two types of people talked about in the story. There's the haters and the seekers. Actually, in this story, there's the one seeker, that's Zacchaeus. And then there are the haters. Because what happens here is Jesus invites himself over to stay at the home of this very unliked sinner in ancient Israel. And when Jesus, in front of all the people, invites himself over, look at what the haters do. Look at what the haters say in verse 7. All the people saw this and began to mutter. Maybe your translation has murmur. I like that word murmur. It sounds like what it is. If you have children or you've been around children or you you just work somewhere where anytime the boss or the one in charge makes an announcement that people don't like, you just hear the sound. Murmur, 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 mutter, mutter. It's like my kids when I tell them, hey, today we're going to clean the house. It's just like all out mutiny. It's just this low rumble. Murmur, murmur, murmur. Well, this is what happens here. Verse 7, they murmur this. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Now, what are the haters hating for? They're hating the fact that Jesus is pursuing a sinner. They think this guy's too far gone. He's too bad. He's too much. He's too dirty, rotten, scoundrel-ish. He's not worth being pursued. He's a sinner. But Jesus reminds us that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. That's actually Jesus' mission statement. He came for the lost. The only criteria for you to receive salvation is that you be lost. Do you have to do much for that? Zacchaeus fit the criteria because he was lost. Jesus said, if he's a sinner, if he's off, if he's bad, if he's wrong, if he's far from the kingdom, that's the kind of person I've come to seek after. The misunderstanding from the crowd is Jesus wouldn't love someone like that. Jesus couldn't love someone like that. But I'm reminded That when there are people in my life that are sinful, unlovely, annoying, raunchy, wrong, whatever the category of sinner they are, and I think that's the last person that Jesus wants to love. Jesus said, that's actually the very person I came for. To misunderstand that is to misunderstand the mission of Jesus. The mission of Jesus, as he says here again, verse 10, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That is the very reason that Jesus came to pursue those who are lost. And if I do not love lost people, I am not like Jesus. Now, lost people seem lost. Their language seems lost. Their outfits seem lost. Their habits are lost. Everything about them is lost. They're dishonest. They are not being governed by the Holy Spirit because they have not yet been found by Jesus. So expect that people that Jesus wants to win are going to appear as lost as they really are. They have no God paradigm. And we have got to continue to foster a community here at Emmaus that loves lost people, that welcomes in people who don't normally what we think belong in church on Sunday morning. I don't want to be a part of a community that looks like a bunch of church people. That's just not the reason that Jesus came. Like, I mean, mind you, I am like quintessential church person. I'm a preacher for crying out loud. Like I'm a walking, talking church man. But, but on the level of, of, of being just real and welcoming and normal and inviting and seeking and saving the lost, that is what Emmaus is for. And, and so therefore, we need to be inviting people into our lives, inviting people into our church community, embracing those who are with us at work, in our neighborhood, in the, the life that we're now living, that are totally lost. 
I, you know, I, I've told this story before, but when I first became a Christian, I was really legalistic. And so I was so zealous for the Lord, I had no love. And, and part of that was a friend of mine who he and I were like the religious zealots of our high school. I went to this very depraved, very small high school in a small town. So I moved from Southern California, like the ghetto hood. I'm wearing the big baggies, like crotch down to here, double pockets, FUBU jersey, Celtics hat on backwards, listen to House of Pain in my 1979 low rider Chevy Impala with the small ghetto steering wheel. And I moved from there to the middle of nowhere, Southern Oregon, and I go to this little tiny high school, Hidden Valley High School, 635 kids at my whole high school. Most of them are wearing Wranglers and cowboy hats, and even the girls, I think, chew tobacco. There was two, there was two categories. You're either a hick or you are white trash living in a trailer smoking pot, right? And so that's just, I, I end up at the school, and, and through a process of just Jesus working, I become a Christian. I meet this other guy, buddy of mine, and he and I just go, we just go full on zealot style. So we're looking at the depravity of our, our small town. I mean, the only thing there is to do in the small town is fornicate and do drugs. And so that's my high school, right? And so I'm just wagging my head every day and literally had this big blue King James Bible I walked around with. Just like, yeah, I'm on mission, right? And everyone's like, bro, dude, I don't want nothing to do with that. Um, so I remember me and my buddy, we're, we're just like judgmental, zealous, lame. And we're, we're at the lake or something, and there's a bunch of kids from our high school, and they are being lost. So just fill in the blank. Whatever lost kids do at a lake, where there's a, a, a cooler full of beverages and uh, pockets full of marijuana and girls and guys in a lake in the summertime, and they are just being depraved. And I thought I was watching Sodom and Gomorrah, and I'm just like, oh, they're going to burn in hell, you know. And I think I'm glad about that, you know. It's just terrible, right? And Jesus was like, no, that's not good. And I remember we're standing there just kind of watching all these kids and this foul junk coming out of their mouth and their lives, and we're just being zealous. And my buddy looks at me and he goes, he looks at me and then he looks at them and he goes, what a waste. <laughs> and I'm just like, yeah, what a waste. It's not like never occurred to us, like go engage, go love, go preach the gospel, go, go like seek the lost. No, what a waste. And so there's this crowd in Jesus' day that was like me and my zealous buddy in high school. The what a waste crowd. The how could Jesus associate with the lost? And Jesus said, actually, that's why I came. Like that is the reason I came. And don't forget that you also were one of the lost. Your lostness may have looked different than other people's lostness. But lost is lost. If you don't know where home is, you don't know where home is. Even if you don't look lost, according to like our together, get togetherness categories in America, if you're lost, you're lost. You may be pretty, but you can be lost and pretty. You may, you may not be bankrupt, but you can be wealthy and lost. Zacchaeus speaks into that. You can have a nice house and be lost. You can have what looks like a picture-perfect family and be lost. You can, you can have a college education and a good job and be lost. Zacchaeus was lost, and Jesus said to the murmuring haters, that's why I came, to go stay with people like that. And I love that Jesus is like, um, ready or not, Zacchaeus, I am coming into your life. Second category of people here, not only the haters, but then secondly, there's the seekers, or we would call them seeker, that is being Zacchaeus. But these are the imperfect, the sinful, the wrong, the selfish, the guilty, those who are lost. They are in need of being found. But notice about seekers, they are those who are hungry and needy and curious. Zacchaeus had been, up to that point, a very depraved human being. Much of his behavior was very wrong. Of that there can be no argument. But he was seeking. Something was changing in him. He's somehow, for some reason, being drawn to Jesus. He wants to see him. He's looking for him. His heart is ready to respond. I want to say that to us about the people that God has put in our lives. And that is that you can't tell by looking at someone that maybe outwardly 
totally sinful, what's going on on the inside? Because there are people I would evaluate, say, I think that person's way off, way too lost. But I think sometimes people look perhaps their worst right before they're about to be found. That actually there are probably people that God has brought into your life that right now you think, that guy never, that woman never. And they may be closer than you even know. They may be in their lostness, quietly empty, miserable, and ready for a change. Don't underestimate the sinners that God has privileged you to have in your life. Privileged you. You are privileged to be in the lives of the lost people that are in your life. It's not right for Christians to try to live in some kind of like Christian bubble, to create our own weird incestuous community where the only thing we ever do is associate with one another. It is a gift of God for you to be brought lost people. And some of them seem so lost, you can't imagine that they would be quietly empty, quietly miserable, quietly searching. But I would say, like Jesus, it would just be safe for us to assume these are people that want Jesus. Better off for you to assume everybody wants Jesus. They just don't know it yet. Assume that about the people you're in, life with, in neighborhood with, in whatever, whatever, whatever your life brings. Assume the people that are in your life are actually really hungry for Jesus and they just don't know it yet. No matter what it appears like on the outside, And then like Jesus, I love what he does. He says, I'm coming into your life. I I would just, even now, just challenge you to walk the way of Jesus and invite yourself in. Even be a little bit pushy. I mean, this is pushy. Jesus didn't know this guy. He sees him up in a tree. He senses that this is a secret. He goes, I'm in your life. I'm going to go stay at your house. And at that very act, the tipping point, Zacchaeus the seeker becomes found by Jesus. And verse 8 says this. Notice his heart response to Jesus being a guest in his home. Zacchaeus stood up. And I'm assuming this is right there in front of all that crowd. And he says to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. There are two saving responses, heart responses that happen in Zacchaeus when he is found by Jesus. And I want you to take note of them. The first one is a natural propensity towards generosity. That is, he just says, you know what, I'm just going to give. He says, uh, I give half of my possessions to the poor. Right off the bat, his heart response to being found by Jesus is generosity. I'm just going to give up of my stuff, half of my stuff to the poor. The second heart response is a heart for restitution. That is, notice, if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Now, that's significant. He had a heart of restitution. If I've wronged someone, I'm going to make it right times four. Now, in the law, if you borrowed something, or damage something that someone else either lent you or that you took without asking you back into their car accidentally, you, you break their lawnmower that you were borrowing, you ruin something of someone's and you were required 100% restitution. That is, I borrowed a lawnmower, I am going to return a brand new lawnmower for the one that I broke. And the law said that you should add 20% for good measure. So if your lawnmower costs, you know, 300 bucks, I'm adding 20% on top of that and reimbursing you that amount. I'm going to get you either that much better of a lawnmower, I'm going to pay you that cash. And that's Leviticus 6.5 and Numbers 5.7, which said you break something, ruin something of someone else's, it's required that you give back fully plus 20% for relationship's sake. But Zacchaeus said, I'm going to give four times more of anyone that I've wronged. Why? Well, because there's this interesting thing in the law. In Exodus 22, verse 1. If you were to steal or take from someone, their sheep or their ox, and you would either slaughter it or sell it, and then it was found out, and you were called on the carpet 
to make restitution, you would have to make restitution up to four to five times of that which you stole. So what is Zacchaeus acknowledging? I have stolen from people. I know it. I've been a greedy, dirty, sinful, lying thief. And I'm going to make restitution. You know that the gospel has been at work in somebody's life when they are ready to, number one, be generous, and number two, make restitution. If Jesus has changed you, generosity should be a part of your story. You should be a giver. If you're greedy, you're not like Jesus. Jesus wants to change that piece of you, that you be a generous person. Also, one of the first things that should happen to us as our hearts are changed is that we are ready to right any wrong we have done. And he says, I'm going to do it times four. I have been very wrong. I am going to make things right. I will make full restitution. Can I ask you a question? Are there any people in your life that you have done wrong to that Jesus would say restitution has not yet been made? Follow the way of Jesus via Zacchaeus. As he stands up and just says in front of everybody, Lord, half of all that I have, I'm giving to the poor. And if I have wronged anyone, I will make restitution up to four times what I stole from them. It's a beautiful story of what Jesus does in a heart. And notice Jesus' affirmation of the change that appeared in Zacchaeus verse 10 or verse 9. Jesus said, today's salvation. Now I want you to Pay careful attention to the words in verse 9. Today salvation, especially that word salvation. Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. So he's a Jewish man. Now what language do you think Jesus spoke? Hebrew, right? Mainly Hebrew. Um, Hebrew and Aramaic, but mainly Hebrew. The text we're reading was written in what language? Greek, right? So it's the New Testament primarily is translated from the Greek to English and the Old Testament Hebrew Aramaic to English. But when Jesus was actually speaking, he was speaking in the Hebrew language. And the word in verse 9 for salvation is, um, for those of you guys who are linguists would understand this, the feminine, feminine form of this word is in the Hebrew, is the word Yeshua. So he just said, today, Yeshua in the Hebrew has come to your house. There's a little wordplay going on here because Jesus' name in Hebrew is what? Yeshua. You know what Yeshua means? It means Jehovah is salvation. God saves. So, so what is Jesus saying? When he invites himself into the home of Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus basically stands up and says, I'm ready to be generous and make restitution. Jesus said, salvation has come to your house. In other words, Yeshua has come to your house. In other words, I am salvation. Brothers and sisters, salvation is not something you get. It's someone you get. You get Jesus. And the Bible says that the, the Lord is my salvation, or the, the Lord is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. That is, God is my salvation. The benefit of being a Christian is Jesus. It's a personal reception, not of just, oh, I get a new lifestyle and I get saved. No, you get Jesus. So now basically, if you were to step away from the story of Zacchaeus, you would just be able to say, here's a man who got Jesus. That's all I can say about my life. Brian, you're saved. Like, what does that all mean? I don't know. The Calvinists are arguing this. The Arminians are arguing this. And there's all these weird people in the middle. And everybody's arguing about all this theological stuff. I just know I got saved. I got Jesus. That's all I need to know. I got saved. I got Yeshua. God saved me. And that's what Jesus pronounces over this man. He said, God has saved your house. Jesus has come into your life. And that, brothers and sisters, is the great salvation that we've received. You belong to him and he belongs to you. You get Jesus. Now Jesus shifts gears on us from this story of Zacchaeus. Then 
we get into this parable called the parable of the ten minus. Now, if you're reading the NIV like I am, it says minus. Some of your other translations read pounds, the parable of the ten pounds. Um, which is kind of funny. Parable of the ten pounds. How much I have to lose after Thanksgiving, um, before summer. This parable, though, is motivated by people's misunderstanding of the kingdom. Look at verse 11. Why did Jesus tell this parable? While they were listening to this, this interaction with Zacchaeus, he wanted to tell them a parable. Why? Because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. So, I, I don't know, I just have this like wild imagination about what they were thinking was about to happen. They were thinking when Jesus got into Jerusalem, immediately kingdom come. Here it is. White horse, swords, like God just overcomes. The Romans bow down to the Jews. The Jews are lifted up. God sits on the throne. They have their Messiah. Things are made right. All things are just brought under the governance of God. So they're thinking like, I, we can't wait to get to Jerusalem. Like, let's not hang out in Jericho too long because when we get into Jerusalem, kingdom's going to come. They literally thought Jesus was going to walk into Jerusalem and set up his kingdom. And Jesus is going to have to tell this parable to teach them that the kingdom, though it will eventually come that way, this isn't the time for that. That there's actually a gap between the first advent of Messiah and the second advent of Messiah. The first time Jesus came, he came to set up an invisible kingdom, a spiritual kingdom. They were waiting for the full-blown, visible kingdom of God. Revelation 19, Revelation 20, a new city, a new heaven, a new earth. They thought that was what was about to happen. And Jesus is like adjusting the thing. Wait, 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 wait. It's not time for that yet. The first advent, he comes in to set the invisible spiritual kingdom. The second advent of Jesus, which we're still waiting for, is when he comes to set up his visible physical kingdom. And we're living in the tension between the first advent and the second advent. He came the first time, sets up the church, the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. He's coming again and he's going to make it all right, right? But until then, we're living in the middle. So Jesus gives this parable to teach us how to live in the middle. How to live in the days that we're living in. So the story he gives is simply this. It's about a nobleman who has to travel to a distant country to claim his right to be the king. Before he leaves, this nobleman calls ten of his servants and entrusts each of them with a mina. Or a pound. Now, we're told from commentaries and such, people who know these types of things, that a mina was the equivalent of a hundred drachmas. And you're like, so what? Um, that, that doesn't mean anything more to me than the mina did. Well, um, basically, a, a drachma was the equivalent of what an average laborer would get after a day's work. So now we're talking about a mina, which is a hundred drachmas, which is the average wage that a worker would get for a day, that is the equivalent in our economics of about 10,000 bucks. So now Jesus uh, is telling the story, a nobleman gathers his 10 servants together and he gives each of them $10,000. And he says, while I'm away, I want you to make use of this money, invest this money, and while I return, I'm going to take an account of what you've done. And so each of the servants gets handed $10,000, but the no one note is in verse 14 that the nobleman's subjects, those who he was going to be made king over, verse 14, said, we don't want this man to be our king. Now, does this, does this sound like a story Jesus is telling about his own kingdom? It does to me. He's going away to become king. While he's gone, he leaves his servants entrusted with some riches to say, put this to work, be stewards over this. And then there are certain subjects that do not want this man to be their king. Did they want Jesus to be their king in Jerusalem, in Israel? No, they did not. That's why they crucified him. And so the story is leading in the sense that he's telling a story about his own kingdom. So this nobleman becomes king despite what his subjects want. And when the nobleman returns, he has two scores to settle. First of all, number one, 
He's going to settle the score of what his servants whom he'd entrusted money to. He's going to settle that score. Secondly, he's going to settle the score with his enemies who rejected him as their king. Now again, I think this nobleman in this story is a pretty obvious tell of the kingdom that Jesus is going to bring in. He's leaving to become king. He'll return and settle the score. That's the story that Jesus tells them as they are misunderstanding what the kingdom currently in their day was. So the master comes back to deal with his servants. And so verse 15, note, he sent for his servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained. So he grabs the first guy, the first servant. Now there's 10 of them. We only hear from three. The first guy comes in verse 16. He says, Master, I took your 10,000 bucks or your, your mina and I increased it and, and I turned it into 10 times what you gave me. So here's $110,000 for the, the 10,000 you gave me. I have, I have kept your mina and times it by 10. He says, well done, servant. Verse 17, you have been trustworthy in a very small matter. Take charge over 10 cities. Do you notice what just happened here? Jesus acknowledges that this man has been given the oversight while he was gone of something very small. Look, he says, you've been trustworthy in a very small matter. Jesus doesn't deny the fact that the man had been given a small task. But he said, now that you've done well with the small task, I'm going to give you not 10,000 bucks, but 10 cities to rule over. What a leap, right? From $10,000 to 10 cities. Think of the budget of just one city. This man is now being given the oversight. Now that his no, his no, this nobleman, his master has become king, the king says, now I'm going to give you a share of my kingdom. Because when I left, I wasn't the king. I was establishing my kingship. When I return, I am the king, and I have the right to give you what I want to give you. You were good with the little I gave you. Here is much more than you could even fathom. The problem, I think, for some of us, as it concerns kingdom faithfulness, is the size of the responsibility that we've been handed. Sometimes we're stumbled by the smallness of the task, the doldrums of our lives. This is just a small job with a small paycheck. I'm just raising small children. I have a very small budget. I have a very simple life, a very simple ministry task. You know, I've, some of you know this, been a pastor since I was 19. I'm 37 now, so I've been a pastor for a long time. Um, so I, I, and I've been a pastor at large churches. And so I've watched a lot of young, ambitious people that wanted to be in ministry. And we would hand them a small task. And just watch. How are they going to do with handing out bulletins? How will they do with moving boxes? Wiping noses? Changing diapers? How will they do with small tasks? Will they be faithful? Will they be on time? Will they be joyful? Now, I want you to remember this. You know, as, as, as I'm evaluating like young guys that we want to maybe potentially bring on as a pastor or something we're watching how they do with small things in that same way jesus is aware of how small the task he gave you is he knows he knows just like this nobleman he knows he handed you a little thing but it's a, a faithfulness test it's a kingdom test how are you going to do with the small things zachariah the prophet asked who's despised the day of small things we could all probably raise our hand when it's small we're not as faithful to it if you were to give me a big task, God, I'd be really faithful with that. I mean, if, if you were to make me like a mega church pastor or you were to give me like a CEO position at a job or if you were to really like give me a big house and lots of money, I mean, if I won the lottery, I would do well with it. We all say. But the Lord said, yeah, but here's the small thing. I just, here's a faithfulness test. I guess the question for me is, how am I doing in the small thing? Because when you think of the largeness of God, you have to ask yourself a question. What's big to him? He says things like, nations are a drop in the bucket to me. 
Things like he holds the universe in the span of his hand. Like God's got the whole thing right here. So if the universe is in his hands, nations are like a drop in the bucket, like little pebbles in a bucket. What is big to God? So therefore, what is small to God? Is there anything you're doing that's really small or big? You're not a big deal. And you're not a small deal. You're God's deal. The tasks you've been given aren't weighed, counted, and measured in the way we weigh, count, and measure them. We weigh, count, and measure everything by quantifiable, quantifiable results. Bricks, butts, and bodies. Right? Bricks, bucks, bodies. Yeah. Um, I said butts. I meant bucks. Um, you could put butts and bodies, you know, whatever. Um, but we're like, how many people were there? How much money? And how much square footage? And Jesus says, those are the wrong metrics. If I give you a mina, that's yours to tend until I get back. So one guy comes and says, here's your 10. I times it by 10. And Jesus says, well done, good servant. I know you were trustworthy with with what seemed very small. Now here's 10 cities. The next guy comes, same thing. He says, I took your one mina and I times it by five. Five times as much. Rule over five cities. But then, the scary part of the story. Verse 20. The part that makes me swallow hard. Another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you're a hard man. You take what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words. Anytime your master says that. Whew. I will judge you by what you just said. You wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow. Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has 10. This is hard to understand. Like, this guy's only got one. He did nothing with it. And Jesus says, give, or the nobleman says, give me what you have and I'm going to give it to the man who's got a lot because he's been faithful, right? Verse 25, sir, they said, he already has 10. That doesn't seem fair. Jesus replied, I tell you that everyone who has more will be given, but as for the one who has nothing, even that that they have will be taken away from them brutal this is the fate of the unfaithful servant he brought his mina to his master wrapped in a little piece of cloth he had done nothing with what he was given because he was afraid to take a risk and it was either fear or laziness or both that kept this man from being productive And the repercussions for the unfaithful servant is he had all of his opportunities taken away from him and given to someone else who was faithful. The principle being taught here, verse 26, is everyone who has, more will be given. But as the one who has has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. In other words, if you don't use what you have, you'll lose what you have. God has given you a life so invest it. God has given you a mina, so use it. Take risks, invest, steward, do well. Now maybe this story sounds familiar to you. Does it sound like another story that you've heard somewhere else? Because Jesus tells a similar parable in Matthew chapter 25. We call this one the parable of the talents. They're similar but different. In that particular parable, a master goes away and he leaves each one of his servants varying amounts of gold, bags of gold. He gives one guy five, one guy two bags, one guy one bag. When the master returns, like this story, he comes to take an account of what has been done with what was given. The guy that had five multiplied it by five or ten or something like that. The guy had two multiplied the two bags of gold for more. The guy who had one, what did he do? He ran out in the backyard, dug a hole, and stuck his bag of gold in the hole and buried it. And then when the master came, he just undug it and said, here's your bag of gold back. Now, in that story, 
the frightful repercussions was that that servant was actually cast into outer darkness. In the Luke 19 story, the one who is actually judged severely here is those rebel subjects who did not want him to be king. Actually, if you note down in verse 27, it actually says for the rebellious, those enemies, verse 27, who did not want to be king, me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. This is a severe story, no matter how you slice it. The Luke 19 story seems to be speaking specifically to Christians over the things that Jesus has left them until he returns. Verse 27 seems to be speaking of those who are his enemies. So remember how the story started. There were people that did not understand how the kingdom worked. And Jesus said, this is how the kingdom works. When the king returns, he's going to evaluate his servants and he's going to judge his enemies. That's the way the story ends. He evaluates his followers and he judges his enemies. He deals with his enemies. The interesting thing about the parable of the ten minas is that every servant in this story gets the same exact opportunity. One mina. That's all you get. So it's not like, you know, the other story, the talents where I can say, well, that's a five talent guy and I'm only a one talent guy. So he's got more chances than I do. In this story saying the, the playing field is level. Everyone has the same chance and therefore will be judged and evaluated on the same level. That is, you had a mina, you had a mina, you had a mina. So you can't say, oh, well, like Luke Overstreet, he's got 10 talents and I've got one. So it's more likely that he's going to succeed than me. No, in the story that Jesus is telling, Luke has a mina, I have a mina. It's even. We both have a life that we need to invest and we will be judged based on our investment. And when Jesus comes back, there are two major themes that are given to us here about the return of the king. First of all, we learn from the story, Jesus is the ultimate authority. And secondly, the accountability of people to him, there is an accountability of all people to him in the end. Our gospel teaches that Jesus is the ultimate king over the universe, over every realm. Think of what Paul said. You know this verse, but don't give it that, yeah, yeah, I already heard that. That's a church verse. I've heard that one. Like, give it your full attention, especially as it concerns this story, that when the nobleman came back, he was the king over the land. When Jesus returns, he will be the noted king of the universe. He is now, but he is coming as one who has all authority. Paul wrote about this. In Philippians 2, 9 through 11, God exalted him to be the, excuse me, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue would acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That verse tells me this Jesus is the king of every realm. Every person bows and every tongue confesses. He's the king of the universe over all people and over every realm. In the heaven, on the earth, and in the underworld. Jesus is king over every aspect of all that is in existence. Every person in every realm. Heaven, earth, under the earth, the underworld. Jesus says, I am the king. And as the king, when he returns, we will all then have to give an account to him. That's the story that we're living in now. We are living as people holding a mina, knowing that the king will return. And when he returns, it'll be clear who the king is. He's king of the universe. And that all people are going to be under his authority. And so as the New Testament rolls out, and you could probably think of a ton of verses, I'm going to mention just a few as the New Testament rolls out, it speaks of a day of judgment. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 talks about the judgment seat of Christ. Romans chapter 14, the same, the judgment seat of Christ. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 to 36, maybe you're aware of that. It's that parable Jesus told of the sheep and the goats, the day when, when at the end of time, God will sit on His throne with all of the angels 
and all nations will be brought to him, and he will separate those who are sheep, his, on his right, and those who are the goats to his left, and that will be the final division of all humanity. John the Apostle wrote in Revelation chapter 20 at the end of time, verses 11 through 15 of Revelation, the scene at the end of time at the, what is called the great white throne, the Lord sits there and He judges all peoples, and it says it happens this way. The books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Now some of you might not like this part of the story. Not like the, the judgment part. Because we're very much about being non-judgmental. We don't like to be judgmental. God isn't asking you to be judgmental. He's the judge. So just let's get that clear right now. I'm not telling you who's in and who's out. Some people say, well, I could never love a God that would cast people into the lake of fire. You think you're more merciful than God? You think you're more just than God? Where do you think you got your sense of mercy and justice? It's sourced in God. There isn't going to be anyone in Revelation chapter 21 or Matthew chapter 25 or, or, or 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5 or Romans 14 at those judgment seats, they're going to be say, that's not fair. Innocent people cast in the lake of fire? No. First of all, I don't think there's a, such a thing as innocent people. But secondly, the judge of all the earth will be fair. He's gone to great lengths to save people. He saves lost people. He's not quick to check people in the lake of fire. He's not quick to decide. When he does, it will be final. But it will be full of mercy and absolute justice and truth. There'll be nothing about that day that we can, from this day, wag our head and go, that's not fair, that's not right. Now, now to speak to us who are here in the time between times, between the time that the nobleman went away and the time that he will return as king. I just want to give you three things, and then I'm done, about faithfulness. During the time, for those of you who follow Jesus, how to be faithful with, with what God has given you. So just a few things for you to think, think through in this parable of the ten minus. First of all, as it concerns faithfulness, number one, do what you can with what you have. Do what you can with what you have. Kingdom faithfulness is a, not about big jobs, big money, and big, big success. It's about living the life that's in front of you. Not waiting for it to get bigger or better or more, but just saying, God, I'm going to lean into my life as it is. I'm going to live the life that's right in front of me. Whatever mine has been entrusted it to me in my life so write the letter love the neighbor raise the kids love the wife be faithful at the job serve people in your life be a good employee take care of what you have use your gifts use what you have while you have it because more is promised to those who are faithful Secondly, take risks. I was going to say take calculated risks, but then I thought some of you overly calculating people would say, there's my excuse. It doesn't add up. Risks don't add up. Take risks with your life. Every investment requires an element of risk. You gain nothing if you risk nothing. Don't Play it safe as it concerns your usefulness for God. Proverbs 14, verse 4, one of my favorite verses says, Where no oxen are, the stable is clean. A lot of you guys pat yourself on the back because you have a clean, a clean stable. No cow pies. No big meadow muffins. Nothing nasty, smelly, swarming in your stable. You're like, I've got a clean stable. Proverbs 14, 4, where no oxen is, the stable's clean. Good for you. But then the proverb says, but much strength is by the ox. You ain't done nothing. You're proud of a clean life, a safe life. 
Show me a life of someone who's got a few cow pies, a few problems, made some mistakes, had some war battles. I'll also probably show you a life full of oxen, risk takers for the kingdom of God. They would say, I can't say it's all been clean. I haven't made some mistakes. I don't have some regrets, but I've done stuff as well. I've dared to live and live big and go large, go big or go home, you know, as we say. So I read this poem, and yes, I'm going to read a poem Sunday morning at church to you. Um, And it's a poem about someone with a clean life. Someone who evaluates that the risks are too risky, therefore I'd rather play it safe. Just listen to this. It's about a guy who lived a clean life. He saw people love each other, and he saw that all love made strenuous demands on the lover. He saw love require sacrifice and self-denial. He saw love produces arguments and anguish. He decided that it cost too much, and he decided not to diminish his life with love. He saw people strive for distant and hazy goals. He saw men striving for success and women striving for high ideals. He saw that the striving was frequently met with disappointment. He saw that strong men do fail. He saw it forces people into pettiness and he saw that those who succeeded were not those who had earned that success. And he decided it cost too much. He decided not to soil his life with striving. He saw people serving others And he saw men give money to the poor and to the helpless. And he saw that the more they served, the faster the need grew. And he saw ungrateful receivers turn on their serving friends. He decided not to soil his life with serving. And when he died, he walked up to God and presented him with his life, undiminished, unmarked, and unsoiled. His life was clean from the filth of the world. And he presented it proudly saying, this is my life. And God said, what life? To live is to risk and to invest and to do and to dare. And I dare you to invest your mina, your life, to do something great. And then finally, number three, investment for the kingdom advice. Number three, you are a steward of God's resources. Remember, it's not yours to begin with. Notice what the master said in verse 13. Put this money to work until I come back. God has given us a resource. All of us have the same resource. Your time. The life and health that you possess. Your talents, the things you're gifted to do. Your treasure, the material resources you've been entrusted. And truth, gospel news, the message of the saving work of Jesus. We all have this given to us. This is our mina. Our time, talent, treasure, and truth. But remember this, this does not belong to you. Your life belongs to God. And he said, put it to work while I'm gone. Because when I come back, I'm going to take it. And I'm going to take an account of how you invested. One day, everything that I am is going to be returned to the Lord. And I believe, as you see in eternity, those 24 elders taking the crowns off their head and casting them down before the throne. Basically, that crown represented who they were and their worth. And they were saying, Jesus, it all goes back to you. You're the one who sits on the throne. It all goes back to you. One of the greatest moments in your life is when you're able to give back to God in worship before the throne, the thing you did with your life. You're just throwing yourself before a throne and saying, God, here it is. It was all yours and and I'm giving it back to you. I'm entrusting you with my life, my time, my talent, my treasure, the truth that you entrusted to me. So just can can I encourage us as we go our way this weekend, this Sunday morning, God has entrusted you with something. Be found faithful realizing that one day you are going to stand before the one whose eyes are like fire and we will all be evaluated by the Lord. I don't want to be that guy with my mina in a napkin saying, here, Lord, I didn't do anything wrong. And he said, but you didn't do anything. God has given us life, opportunity, and people to love. So let's go out and do kingdom work for the king is coming And when he does, his reward is with him. Amen?